Good morning, everybody. Uh, Stephen Russell here, uh, President and CEO of the San Diego Housing Federation. Really glad to welcome you all to uh, the second day of our Fair Housing Conference, put on by the San Diego Regional Alliance for Fair Housing and the San Diego Housing Federation. Uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes here. I see folks are filling up the room, and uh, wow, almost everybody's here already. That's great. Um, I want to remind folks that throughout the, the day that we encourage you to put your questions in chat. We, everybody's watching the chat. It's a great way to, to speak to your colleagues. It's a great way to speak to the entire group, and it's a good way to elevate your questions and contribute to the discussion that we're having here. Uh, we will be recording the session. It is currently being recorded, so please be aware that uh, um, uh, <laughs> things you say are part of the record here, but for the most part, you know, we want to make sure that other folks have a chance to access this uh, this remarkable uh, uh, programming that we're doing here. Um, I um, I do want to take the moment uh, to thank um, our sponsors. Uh, the San Diego Regional Alliance for Fair Housing is a great partner in producing this, and uh, later I'll introduce Estela de los Rios, the president of uh, SIDRAF. Um, San Diego Housing Federation is really pleased to partner with them on this uh, fifth uh, collaboration in pre presenting this conference. I also want to thank our sponsors, California uh, Department of uh, Housing and Community Development, California HCD, uh, Union Bank, Studio E Architects, who's responsible for a lot of the really fine architecture that our sector produces here in, in the urban fabric, um, and San Diego Housing Commission. And I know we have some great representatives of the commission here today. Uh, participating. So I want to thank them for their work and for their support. Um, again, I want to thank the San Diego Housing Federation staff uh, for what for their tireless efforts here. Uh, Mersa Imani, who has been working on our Homeless Experienced Advocacy and Leadership Program, and we will hear from uh, folks uh, in the later part of today uh, about HEAL. Uh, Laura Nunn, who is our uh, director, I'm sorry, chief of policy and education for the San Diego Housing Federation, puts together so much of the content of our educational programming um, and has been instrumental in pulling this together. Uh, Sneha Craig, who is our uh, office manager, again, a title that doesn't begin to describe all that she does uh, for us and for this cause, uh, but a uh, critical, critical player here. And Brooklyn Del Priori, who is our coordinator for programming and education um, and uh, really is behind the scenes here making sure that all of this runs uh, pretty much seamlessly. Um, very proud to have a, a, the, the, the entire San Diego Housing Federation team is amazing. Really proud to have them um, to have them and working on our behalf here. Um, yesterday's conversations, you know, some of them were hard uh, but necessary. Uh, I think that um, you know Daniel Enemark really uh, laid bare some of the uh, existing conditions and what led to them and some of the intentionality behind it, and that was really hard, um, but necessary. I mean, one of the things I think we see with current housing elements even uh, is that um, uh, that language that has has racial undertones, pretends to be neutral, still can be can be used to try to keep people. Um, keep people down, frankly. Uh, in particular, one of the examples that was brought to my attention recently is in, some, in one of the housing elements. Uh, folks, uh, uh, city staff uh, avowed that, uh, that communities of color are used to different levels of crowding, and so that really we shouldn't be looking at them as being overcrowded because there may be cultural preferences. Uh, for that. And so what they're really doing is taking some of the um, conditions that, folk, that people are accepting because they don't feel they have choice for economic and other reasons uh, and saying, well, they kind of like it that way. And that's, that's a form of, of, of bias uh, that's, that, well, it's a form of bias. <laughs> and we have, to, we have to call it out when we see it. And I want to give kudos to Lauren Nunn for calling that out, putting it in the public record, and telling HCD that they need, that they should respond back to that municipality that that's an unacceptable way to justify overcrowding in your, in your community. Um, the um, uh, second panel we had yesterday, we, we, it was, I just really want to appreciate that Jess Gould, uh, who I hope maybe got to attend this morning, um, that, uh, to, to, to share a very personal vision of what it meant to, to be challenged by uh, the need for housing and, and the inability or unwillingness, I should say, of landlords to acknowledge that they have a duty uh, to provide housing, not just for a select few, but really for the community as a whole. And what does that mean from a personal level? Uh, we also brought that to maybe more of a, a, a 
bureaucratic level. Uh, uh, Brandon Butler talking about his work at uh, uh, Fair Housing and and, uh, and Fair Employment and Housing, uh, DEA. I'm not going to say his agency name because I always get I always get the the acronym wrong, but Fair Housing and and and, uh, and employment. Uh, just what it means to try to enforce that at a higher level, um, and then uh, the challenges that uh, uh, in building that were talked about a little bit by Aaron Montgomery from Chelsea uh, is, is something that we are committed to here at the Federation. That the challenges that we face in actually providing the housing that is affordable um, is something we're, we work on constantly to try to lower those barriers and to try to find those resources. So it was a very rich day yesterday. Um, and I'm expecting a very rich day today as well. I'll, I'll give a bit of an introduction to Dr. Green uh, when, when uh, uh, after Stella says a few words. But I think that we have a real wonderful opportunity to go from the the challenges we identified yesterday. And Dr. Green is going to, while staring squarely at the issues that we're confronting here, lead us, I think, forward to a, to a, uh, to a deeper understanding of that, that and a reconciliation of sorts. Um, with that, perhaps I could turn to Estela. Would you like to uh, say a few words? Estela Dos Rios, who is um, with CSA, uh, County of San Diego, and um, is the president of the uh, San Diego Regional Alliance for Fair Housing. Estela. Thank you, Stephen. Welcome, everyone. Good morning for another exciting day of conference, Fair Housing Conference Day 2. As we continue to celebrate Fair Housing Month, today we will examine the deep racial and ethnic inequities that exist in this present moment. As a direct result of structural racism, we will probe into the historical and contemporary policies, practices, and norms that create and maintain entitlement. We will examine how structural racism continues to disproportionately segregate communities of color from access to opportunity and upward mobility by making it more difficult for people of color to secure quality education, jobs, housing, healthcare, and equal treatment in the criminal justice system. For decades, the role of racism and race in our public and private institutions have offered evidence-based solutions to address these inequities. Our discussion today, we will continue to elevate in the public discourse around race and racism in America and in our San Diego region. Our nation's fair housing laws were created to stop housing discrimination and create equal housing opportunities. However, residential segregation is the worst of today's inequities and it continues to worsen over the years. Our Fair Housing Act passed in 1968 sought to ban housing discrimination and dismantle segregation. There's no question that access to housing remains unequal. Despite longstanding laws guarding against discrimination, members of disadvantaged groups have a harder time finding a high quality place to live in a high opportunity neighborhood. Discrimination by landlords and real estate agents block minorities from moving into white neighborhoods and produce high levels of racial segregation. Commonly, Blacks and other minorities are excluded from neighborhoods with high quality housing, schools, and public services. With uh, lenders are less willing to invest in predominantly minority communities or have offered predatory loans and loan terms that strip wealth from minority homeowners. Today's session will highlight racial justice and the costs of racial and ethnic segregation, not just for individuals, but for society as a whole. We will hear testimonials from individuals that have experienced the levels and forms of present day housing discrimination. For our first session, it is entitled Overcoming Structural Bias. I am very honored to have as our guest keynote speaker, Dr. Zachary Green, Director, Leadership Development, Nonprofit Institute, Professor of Practice, Leadership Studies, Schools of Leadership and Education Science, University of San Diego. And to introduce Dr. Green is our fantastic CEO moderator, Stephen Russell from our San Diego Housing Federation. Thank you to the San Diego Housing Federation and thank you Sidraf again for hosting our fifth annual conference. Welcome and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Estela. Thank you very much for, for that introduction. Uh, I'm really pleased today to be uh, introducing uh, Dr. Zachary Green. Um, I think that uh, uh, with nearly three decades of experience working in issues related to human relations, including going beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, Dr. Zachary Green is going to be, you know, I think a welcome um, tonic, I think, to maybe some of what we heard yesterday. 
Yesterday's introduction by Daniel Enemark talking about the history of racism in San Diego in particular, the nation as a whole, but in San Diego in particular, uh, was both illuminating and distressing. But it was an essential thing, I think, to, 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 to prepare us to begin to have the discussion to really address the root causes uh, of racism and discrimination. Um, that's why we're really pleased to, to welcome Dr. Zachary Green. In the, in the brief time I've gotten to know him, he has a presence and a, and a mind that, that I think really will help us focus uh, and will help us visualize, visualize a moment of grace and healing in the midst of all that we've learned today. So I will say uh, no more other than to introduce uh, Dr. Zachary Green uh, to, to the stage here and, and encourage people, put things in the chat. We're gonna, be, we're gonna be paying attention toward the end of his talk. We'll have a chance to ask those questions. So with no further ado, uh, let me introduce to you, Dr. Zachary Green. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you very much, Estella, for giving that wonderful introduction. I hope I'm able to meet the standard that you're asking of me. Uh, again, my name is Zachary Green. I'm a professor of practice at the University of San Diego. But before coming to San Diego, I lived in Washington, D.C., where a lot of the work that I was doing was with a group called the National Multicultural Institute. There, I was a senior uh, associate. And I worked not only in terms of domestic issues, when there was a terrible problem between Korean uh, store owners and uh, African-American residents, when there were issues at the International Monetary Fund, when they were trying to work on issues of discrimination. And I was even a part of the Clinton administration's uh, effort to hold racial dialogue. And that didn't work, but we tried. And so I've been a part of a number of issues and even internationally working on issues between various people in Northern Ireland who would, we would say are all white, but some of the same kinds of struggles. So we're gonna be looking at all these kinds of things from the perspective that I try to bring, which is a broader based understanding how structural, and then we're gonna change that language over to systemic racism shows up. I wanna thank both the San Diego Regional Alliance as well as the San Diego Housing Federation for inviting me because what I've been trying to do is not go so much deeply in terms of the housing history, though I will refer to that to tie into the work that was done yesterday, <clears throat> but what we're going to do really is begin to move this from a personal, uh, from a collective systemic journey to a more personal one. And so I'll be sharing slides in a moment that gets us there. And I really encourage you, you're going to have thoughts along the way. Please put them in the chat. We'll use that at the end as a basis for some conversation. I hope to allow for enough time for that. But, you know, I'm a professor, so I might rant on, you know, and find a piece that I get excited about. Forgive me for that. It's an occupational hazard. Uh, but I also want us to really think about this in terms of the personal journey, because where we're going to go at the end of this is closer to the personal journey where we as individuals need to be paying attention to our journey and where we need to go in order to get to the next step. So I hope that's an acceptable way to approach this. And let me do this screen share, which after a year in COVID, one would think I know how to do, but it still gets to be a bit of a challenge for me. So here we go. There it is. Okay, and then I'm going to try to share. And there it is. And I hope you can see it. Uh, yes. Okay, so you should say, something that's saying overcoming structural racism, systemic and personal. Uh, if someone can give me a thumbs up to let me know that you're seeing that. Yes, yes, we see it. Okay, this is so exciting. Okay, so as you can see, so what we're gonna be doing is moving from the systemic to the personal. Uh, and so let's begin by defining terms. First, we're gonna talk about racism in the sort of larger sense of the word. And so here we go. And yes, I know it's in the view so that I can follow my slides. So one of the things that we run into is that racism is understood at, in about 300 million different ways uh, in this country, meaning that each of us has a different understanding and way of working with it. I like to use this one from the Center for the Study of, of Policy where they say, systemic subjugation of members of targeted racial groups who hold less social political power and or are racialized to uphold race-based hierarchy and dominance. 
Racism differs from prejudice, hatred, or discrimination because it requires one racial group to have systematic power uh, and act in a manner that suggests superiority over other groups in society. Often racism is supported and maintained both implicitly and explicitly, very important there, by institutional structures and policies, cultural norms, values, and individual behaviors. So what I ask you to think, okay, well, is that how I think about it? So this is just a place to start, but what I want each of you to think about is whether this is also how you think about it. Now let's get into the notion of structural racism. And there are two words, well, actually one word that you see highlighted twice there, which is system, and there will be a reason for that in a minute, is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representation, and other norms work in various often reinforcing ways uh, to perpetuate racial inequity it identifies dimensions of our history and culture, very important there, that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages with color to endure and adapt over time. Structural racism is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it has been a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we exist. The reason that I highlight the word systems is because structural racism and systemic racism are often used as interchangeable terms. The larger word structural means all the different ways in which this happens, which encompasses systemic racism, institutional racism, interpersonal racism, but it also means that what we're going to focus on is the systemic, the interconnection of all of this. And so uh, sort of stay with me, okay? So when we talk about this, the so systemic racism includes this array of practices. The, 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 it is the, about the political power. Uh, it's, it is about the ways that core racist realities are manifested in society. And then that means in terms of economy, that means in terms of politics, education, religion, the family, and this all works together. And that's what makes it systemic. So what is really key here is to understand that from a systemic perspective, that all of these things are happening in the same way at the same time. Well, what are you talking about? Well, let's talk about it this way. Yesterday, you were talking about the redlining consequences and the lived experiences of that here in San Diego. We also know that a part of housing up until 1968 allowed for restrictive covenants uh, so that certain neighborhoods could literally have laws or policies or practices that restricted certain groups from certain neighborhoods. There is a the historical legacy of, uh, of these impediments. And there's the, also the enslavement legacy that is on top of that, that uh, talks about chattel slavery, that certain people were property. And then when we get into issues of property, the devaluing of those enslaved people then play out in this. What we also know is that these things then connect together systemically in terms of educational opportunities. It then plays out in terms of social and institutional practices. And then what is really very pernicious about this is that underneath all of that is that a lot of this is implicit. Implicit, It's unconscious. We don't even notice that it's happening. And so what happens when we begin to think about these things is that it becomes very intense and very powerful within us. So in terms of this particular audience, as we know, the redlining practices were a part of this history. Uh, in terms of the redlining practices, uh, we also know that that meant that certain populations, which we would call white, and then other populations, which we call people of color, and particularly black, had different access to loans uh, and opportunities, and therefore the valuing of the property then shifted. 
This then had the consequence in terms of educational opportunities because the differences in neighborhoods, the valuing of houses, the reinvestment as a consequence of that all played into this. And then what we have from there is that then you have this divide based in education and housing that led to an overall process where we see the consequences of today. And what are those kinds of consequences? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about because what I want you to think about is that if this were a poll, and you don't have to do this uh, in the chat, but I want you to think about this. Given the history and definitions of racism in, in, in terms of uh, fair housing, to what degree do you think racism is an issue today? So in your context, in your context, is this a big problem now? Is this somewhat of a problem? Is this a small problem or not a problem? So what would be wonderful if we did an actual poll, then we could see where uh, all of us are on this. But I want you just to think about where you are because I'm gonna show you a slide in a moment to show the challenge that we have about even having this conversation and the ways that these polarities show up. So think about that for yourself for another 10 seconds. All right. Now, having thought about that, a moment ago, I said all of the things that we are working with have consequences in terms of systemic racism. And a lot of what I'm going to do briefly, but with some depth, is to look at generational trauma and poverty, mass incarceration, academic achievement gaps, digital divide, health and wealth disparity, disparity, and even life expectancy. All of these, we're seeing growing evidence that these can't just be explained by the level of education that a person has. It can't be explained by uh, economic mobility. That when we take those, we professor types, tease out those pieces, then we still see gaps then how do we understand that? So let me first say that this is where we are today in terms of race. And this was before uh, we even got to the Chauvin uh, trial and in, in terms of the murder of George Floyd, that what we can see is that all Americans see this differently. So you can see in the darker color there that 28% of Americans overall say, okay, this is a big problem. And 41% say it's somewhat of a problem. What has shifted in the last year is that there are more white Americans, majority now that say that race is an issue and that this is either a big problem or somewhat of a problem, which has changed dramatically in the last two years. But what you will also notice is that the difference between black Americans and white Americans is still considerable in terms of like one, what we call standard deviation, one whole chunk of people uh, really see that there is a, a, a difference here. And so when it's closer to greater than 85% for, for uh, black folks, uh, and then you see it's about 63% uh, for uh, white folks, then what you see is that there's still a gap in terms of how this is perceived as an impact in terms of people's lives. What we also know is that now in terms of the violence towards the Asian community, there are aspects of this that then become more nuanced, more complex, and we have to begin to understand then how does this play out in terms of our overall history. So I'm gonna be a little academic for a second to say how this systemic racism works, and I hope you can just stay with me on that. In the kind of uh, aqua blue there, you will see uh, and this is from a group called Bridgespan that has been studying these issues for years. It says that around issues of housing, criminal justice, public health, education, banking, we see this array of how systemic racism shows up. And then it doesn't just show up in terms of the systemic elements of it. It also shows up in the institutional policies and practices that we have 
It happens in my relationship to you and your relationship to me. And then it also has this other piece, which is the internalized piece. It's the part that as an African-American person that I carry inside of me as a function of what I've received as messages through my life. And I'll give you a small personal story. When I was in high school, I was an awful basketball player. <laughs> Uh, but it was perceived when I came to the playground that I would be good. And then when every time I would sh throw, <laughs> shoot and hit a brick, uh, that then there would be this incredulous look about how that happened. But there's also a part of me that consciously and deliberately chose not to play that sport. Matter of fact, I played tennis. I, I identified with Arthur Ashe as a way of doing that. And so I wanted to be someone who broke through the stereotype. And so that was also a function of not just what was going on outside of me, but it was also a part of me that didn't want to play into it. It was also a function of the internalized racism. And so all of us to some degree or another may have internalized aspects of where we are on the racial spectrum, which we're gonna talk about later. But it also is in the different ways that we are in relationship to one another. So my, my colleagues at Bridgespan then talk about that there's a personal, interpersonal, institutional and structural or systemic way that this plays up. And that all of these things then show up in how it is expressed with one another. So we express it in terms of systems, we express it in terms of discriminatory policies, we express it between one another. And then there are private practices, private beliefs that don't show up, but are still there. And so what I would like you to think about is that, do you see this? Do you see this in terms of your own personal practices, even if it's in your head? Do you see it in relationships between people where it can be explained in part at least by race? Do you know of policies and practices, especially even in housing now? And the kind of things that Stephen brought up earlier, are those also there? And then do you see it in larger systemic elements where these things are so connected with one another that it's hard to discern it? So here's some thought bubbles that'll help us think about it. Is it in terms of systemic, is it, so is it an ongoing uh, inequality? You know, and is it materialized in society? Uh, at the institutional level, are there policies and practices uh, that my organization has or any organization that I'm a part of is, a, is seeing? On an interpersonal, are there interactions between individuals through our words or actions that sort of speak to this? And then finally, are there beliefs and feelings that I have that I recognize may be a function of race? Right now, I'm doing a uh, training with the United States Air Force, and I was presenting on material like this. And then in the middle of the presentation, uh, there was one person I was referring to and, and continuing to use a name. Uh, but I was not calling the person by the right name and someone gently put in the chat, you're calling this one by that name. And what I noticed is that all I saw was their uniforms. I didn't bother to differentiate between the two gentlemen. This is a way that the sort of implicit, automatic ways that this shows up, that I didn't take the moment to go beyond what was literally in front of me uh, to really begin to see how this played out. And then my own attitudes about the military and my relationship to it was then sort of like the shame response that I had was that uh, re reflecting something. But when we were able to talk about it and then they said that that's often something that happens is that because of uniform, they are seen in a certain way. Now let's extend that to issues of race where first we see it and whether we have been trained to be colorblind or not, the issue is that these issues, these, these things still show up on an individual level. Now I offer myself as an example to say that I'm not immune to this, nor are we, because these things show up 
in terms of health. Now, this is one of the ways that I want to point out that what we know is that in terms of Black women and in terms of maternal health, that African-American women have preventable outcomes in terms of pregnancy and health, uh, maternal health that are different from white women. You know, we see that there's a 13% difference of this. Now, let me show you the deeper study on this. Allostatic load is basically a fancy way of talking about the amount of stress that we carry around. And you will notice that, okay, uh, La Latino women, Hispanic women carry more stress than black women or white women, okay? But when we look at maternal mortality rates, if you control for the level of stress that people have in their life, you still see that the maternal mortality rate for black women is higher than either of the other groups. And you also see that the infant mortality rate is higher. So then the researchers then wonder, how do you explain that? Because if the thing that we believe leads to compromise in terms of maternal health is about the stress that we carry, then how is it that we have these differentiated numbers in terms of black women? So that would be one of the ways. What we know in terms of education is that nearly 50% of students of color are in high poverty schools and less than 10% of white students are. And then this is connected to the historic elements of, in terms of housing. And then this leads to, as I said before, issues around education. And then what we also know is in terms of incarceration, while African-Americans represent 13% of the population, 37% uh, of incarcerations are drug related. And we had a recent admission by a member of the Nixon administration that the war on drugs was in part, in part created as a way of stemming black nationalism at the time. And so with the changes in marijuana laws, and there's another study that I could show you, is that they did a study of use of marijuana between white Americans and black Americans, found that the use was equivalent, about. But the incarceration rate of black Americans around marijuana was three times that of white Americans. Okay, so where do we explain that? And how do we understand these issues? Okay, this is so exciting. I'm having a good time. I don't know about you. So we're, to review that is that then there are norms, there are policies, there are practices that are laws and indeed unconscious implicit things that all come together to create this systemic or structural racism. <sighs> okay, now this is your moment. Put in the chat, um, uh, do you see evidence of systemic racism in terms of norms, policies, practices, laws, or even unconsciously. So what we want you to do is just sort of interact with this. Uh, say yes in terms of uh, laws, yes in terms of practices, no, I don't see it, uh, I question it. Because that gives us a picture of how we are working with this. I'll give you another, no, a minute or two, we'll look at that. A whole minute, a whole minute. Okay, thank you for offering these. I really appreciate this. Oh, those are powerful <laughs> examples. Okay, notice the range of responses that we are having to this. Notice the different ways that we're seeing nuances of this, questioning this. All of these things are important because in order to have the conversation, what we're doing in the chat right now is a representation of the complexity of this particular conversation. What we are trying to do here is create an avenue or an opportunity for this conversation to take place. 
Now, what I said I was going to do is then provide you some data, and then your, your job is to sort of interact with this data as best you can. So let's look at the contemporary aspects of this. This is well known, and most of you already know this, but <clears throat> in terms of the share of hospitalizations, <clears throat> So we know that nearly 60% of those hospitalized for COVID have been uh, white people. And, and white people represent 43% of the population. Now, if 33% of those uh, who are hospitalized are, I, I reversed that 59%, uh, 43. The darker color tells you the share of hospitalization. <clears throat> so what you will see is that in the black group that the relative population to COVID hospitalization is higher, okay? Uh, and then when you also go to Native American groups, you will see that you have the same kind of issue uh, as with Black Americans. Okay, I'm unmuted now, thank you. You will notice that there is the same kind of issue that we're finding uh, where uh, black Americans are disproportionately more likely to be hospitalized. And unfortunately, in terms of death rates, uh, is also much higher. Now, if we look at another set, of, I'm just gonna go through a set of data right now. When we look in housing, now, even though this has been declining over the last 15 years with a blip, of course, during the Great Recession, uh, the orange line that you see is in terms of Black Americans, where loan applications still tend to be higher than any other group. When we look at household wealth, this is the biggest challenge. So one of the consequences in terms of wealth is the difference between a household wealth of black Americans and white Americans e and that while there's been an increase over the decades for white Americans there's only been this very modest increase in terms of black Americans when you begin to look at per capita income uh, each person in the household you'll see this tremendous gap of about $18,000 a year per person. When you begin to look at what happened in COVID, when there was a spike in unemployment, uh, what you already had was a gap that was sort of steady, but it looked like it was declining. But now what is happening is that uh, even though there is a return to work that is happening, uh, there's another curve that shows that uh, the African-American rate has still leveled off and that the other rates in terms of other populations is declining. So the recovery for Black families is slower around this. The next part is in terms of wage gaps. Uh, what you will see here, whoops, I messed that up, is that in terms of wage gap, I lost that one. Uh, let's see if I can find it again. There you go. And in terms of wage gap, we, you see that is 62 cents on every dollar compared to white Americans. But this is the one that is now important generationally in terms of where we are, is that what we see is that in terms of wealth of the next generation, we have a wealth gap that continues to be present. And because of this continued wealth gap, and also the disproportionate impact of college loans, then we're going to continue to see this uh, element in terms of wealth for another generation. You also see the mobility is far less for black families and indeed any other group in that respect. And then what I want you to also note here is that when you look at median income, then you see the gap, which we alluded to before, but you also see that the poverty rate uh, remains higher for Black Americans. And so as a consequence of all of these things, we see these systemic consequences that often gets attributed to race. <clears throat>
It is one vector or one factor of understanding this. So let's try to get out of this uh, because this is depressing. So my friends at Bridgespan said that, okay, we have a responsibility. And what I want you to attend to is that in terms of awakening to this and becoming woke around it to use the contemporary language and the work that we have, is that there are places where we would need to look at our work. What we know is that systemic racism, structural racism, institutional racism, the big ones require that senior leaders and those of you who are senior leaders in this area would have to be the voices in this process to begin to look at the kind of data that I presented, look at it in your particular context to see if the data affirms this and would need to be the voices. So the senior leaders would have to be the voices you are the ones that really have to bring this forward. And then what you do is that you turn to the data. The challenge then is then to have the conversations, the dialogue around the organizational culture. That means to be able to create the conditions so that there are next one learning environments that are not attacking, that are not diminishing of one group, that is not blaming and shaming, uh, that does not make one group feel like, I don't wanna be there because I'm just gonna get beat up, or one group gets so triggered and so activated that they have to do all the work. Someplace in between there is the work of this process. Those of us who work in institutions that have boards, the boards also have to have the grander policy be there and the optics of the board. Does the board reflect the communities that are served? Does the board also have diversity of thought, diversity of social identity? And then finally, then how is this communicated to the communities so that the managers, the individuals, the people that are working on this are equipped with ways of having these conversations? So I want you to now think for yourself, in terms of this uh, awake, woke work cycle, where are you right now? Uh, are you at a point where you're just recognizing this? Are you beginning to do some work around this? Or is this a place where you are just beginning to have the evolving place? First, that part. And then the second part is that where is the point of intervention that you've already started? Uh, if you're an individual, you may say, well, you know, I have some things to work on myself and that's where we're going next. But moving this from the structural at the macro level, the bigger level to these kinds of levels, where might be a point of inter intervention? And I want each of you to think about, okay, this is where we are, but this would be the next part of that gear. This would be the next part of this that we need to work on. And what I'd like you to do is sort of commit to selecting a place where you might work on this. Now let's move this more personally. The personal part of this is that the work that we do isn't always work. What do you mean? I, I, I you know, we wrote our statement as an organization. Uh, we uh, invested in uh, black owned businesses. We put out a statement last week around it. Uh, anti-Asian uh, xenophobic uh, violence, yes. But the emphasis sometimes on those behaviors is also called performative. And there's a difference between performative empathy and what is called transformative empathy. So see, performative empathy is about what is called virtue signaling. That means they look at us. It's much more driven by the ego and what uh, sells uh, politically but it does not necessarily do, though it is a beginning and an important part of the process. It does not really get to the deliberative work of ongoing learning and commitment, uh, where the emphasis therefore is on the behaviors, the behaviors that we have that really may disrupt the status quo, that really may lead to uncomfortable conversations, but it, it is a commitment when it's transformative to the continuous learning process, as opposed to something that is more about the performance. 
It's harder work. It is much more uncomfortable. So therefore, what we now need to think about is then where am I in this process? There's a wonderful group called Surgery Design that developed this, and I've been using it ever since. It said in terms of racial equity and in terms of structural racism, where am I? Often we uh, don't really even think about this. And if we do, we may get caught in the fear zone where we really are, are fearful. I'm uncomfortable with these conversations and I, I don't want to really just deal with this. And I, uh, I talk to others who look, look like me. So we may be in the fear zone around these things. Other versus, others of us are in a more of a learning zone place where, okay, I understand that you know, there's some issues around structural racism. I understand that there are vulnerable groups. Uh, I listen to others who think differently than I. Okay, so that, that, that may be the learning zone. But some of us are in this growth zone, okay, which is very much tied to moving this into a place where uh, I can stay with the discomfort of this and I can begin to yield my position long enough to be able to hear other voices and I can begin to surround myself, not only listen to, but surround myself. And I want you to think about that. And if you're comfortable, put this in the chat. Where are you? I personally would love to say that I'm in the growth zone in terms of all of these issues, but it's not true. For me, I straddle between learning and growth, even though this is what I've done professionally for 30 years. I would love to say I'm solidly in growth, but sometimes I... I recognize and Paul pray as I gave you the example in terms of my work right now, this day with the military, that I still have learning zone areas that show up. So where are you? And again, those of you who feel comfortable and putting it in the chat, you know, put it in the chat because that gives us a sense of where we are collectively in terms of this process. Where are you? Fear zone, learning zone, growth zone, or someplace in between. Thank you to those of you who are giving us a picture because that gives us a snapshot of where we are. Now, as we're getting close to the, the end of this, then let's look at this because one of the parts that makes this so difficult to know where we are is because sometimes systemic bias is implicit bias because our attitudes, stereotypes, and associations that we hold are outside of our conscious awareness. We don't even see this. And the hardest thing to do is to show people implicit bias. So I use this one. And so uh, get ready to look at the screen. And then what I want you to be able to do is this. Read this statement. Okay. I trust most of you, after a second or two, were able to read this. If we recognize by analogy that what we can do with words is to read this paragraph and can become more aware of these biases, what the invitation here is to recognize that there are automatic ways that our biases show up and that that's not good or bad in and of itself. But once we become aware of the biases, then we have a responsibility to begin to do it differently. The absence of it or the denial of it is the issue, which then keeps us away from our pathway. And so what I'm gonna offer you as the final piece here is a pathway where a lot of us begin this by thinking of ourselves as, you know, I, I'm, I'm not racist, which is fine. It is a beginning. It is a way of thinking about it. it's not racist. But given implicit elements, given the systems in which we're embedded, 
then it really then means that there may be a journey of uh, like indifference or not knowing to one where our next step is silence because we we're, we we're, we're have some fear. Remember the fear zone we talked a moment ago about? And then the other slide talked about then we can become awakened to this and say, oh my goodness, this is an issue. And we're prone to make errors in that awakening, which is totally fine. And then hopefully we won't just then go back and into our silence, but we will say, okay, let me learn from that so that I become more pacifist. What is pacifist? Okay, that means that, okay, on social media or, or in uh, reading a newspaper article, what I'm gonna do is I will like something or begin to recognize that, ah, I can begin to see this. Then our next step is this performative place. Performative is okay in terms of the journey. So performative then allows us to listen to that podcast. It allows us to read that book. It allows us to do the learning, but to be careful about the virtual signaling about it, to say, look at me, look at me, look at me, as opposed to look at what I'm learning so that I can do to the next part. And that's to be informative to work with others where we begin to take that risk in that meeting with our close colleague so that we begin to have this conversation and then perhaps move it to the point of advocacy because sometimes we are the only voice in the room. So advocacy in terms of its word origin means to add voice. So can we add our voice to the circumstance? That's the personal part that begins to affect structural racism in its systemic expression. And then for some of us, we want to take it to the next level, where it's about activism, where we're looking at in our organizations around policy, there can be activism around policy. But for some of us, that means the protest and taking the risk. That means really moving from being just an ally around these issues. But what the, 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 the movement talks about is being an accomplice, being someone who's willing to even go to jail or you know, risk something. But the last part of that is about transformative. That means absolutely dismantling the current system. Uh, and moving towards an anti-racism piece where one's job, the potential of jail, and even one's body is placed at risk. And that's towards becoming anti-racist. And that really means a no shame and no blame. And if we had time, I'd love to do a breakout around this. But for, for what I want us right now is to, to just sort of think about where are you, okay? Now, again, to model for myself, I would love to tell you I'm in the transformative part of this. I dismantle systems all the time, uh, that I was uh, a part of the uh, marches uh, last summer, and that would not be true. Now, there was a point in my life around 20 years ago where that was true, but, and there was a level of more direct activism that I do. But right now, my place in the journey is much more of the informative and the advocacy. And I affect policy where I can in terms of my work in consulting and teaching. And the transformative therefore is suggested, but it's not where I personally live right now. So I would ask you to think about where are you in terms of your journey? Because systemic racism is not simply bigger systems outside of our control. Systemic racism is us because we are a part of these systems. So, so where are you and where to begin? So what I would ask you to think about as we close is then, you know, there, there was something that you heard in this last few minutes uh, that spoke to you. Just one thing. So what is that one thing? And the way that we know from uh, education that this works is if you write down that one thing right now, even if it's in your phone or on a piece of paper, you're more inclined to recall it and you're more inclined to take action on it. So what is that one thing? 
second thing, who is that one person with whom you can have the conversation? That way you begin to move from performative to informative in terms of addressing systemic racism. You move it from the individual to the interperson. Now, what also is important is that there's something that I said for many of you that is challenging that you may vehemently disagree with. It is really important also to pay attention to where that challenge is because it may be tomorrow, the next day, five years from now, that that shows up again and that this moment will then connect and you'll say, oh, okay, that's what he's talking about. Or, oh, I still disagree with it, but now I've had more evidence that there are many people that are in their journey and they think about it this way. And then finally, there's something that is said here, hmm, that's interesting. Let me explore this on my own. Let me begin to find some way of education or if we're in positions of authority, let me bring that forward in the work that we do. So I would invite all of us to think about what is that? So please begin where you are, but what's most important is to begin because this city, this nation, is looking for a way that housing is something that is more fair and equitable. And you are the voices, you are the people that we're waiting for. You are the ones that we seek to bring it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, I, I think in my introduction, I suggested that uh, uh, that you would help us bring us to a place of grace um, after some of um, the uh, potentially traumatic or traumatizing uh, discussions we had yesterday. And I thank you for, for taking us very much on that journey, starting from that place. And, um, and yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm almost speechless at the moment. Um, I do want to open this to questions from folks. This is one of the things I actually have to say. This this is part of the one of the structural biases is that you and I get to be uh, presenters and get to have voices, and we put people in another place through chat. But but I want to encourage people to use the voice we have here in this setting. Um, and uh, and say for myself, I think what is challenging is to, um, and I, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of folks is is how do I go about being more connected to other people in my environment without seeking out that black friend right <laughs> and it's it's obviously in this environment one of the things that is true of the pandemic is that we are ever more limited to our circle of friends that 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 we had when we started but soon we're going to have an opening we're going to have a reopening and an opportunity to go back in the world can you talk about that issue of um because that can be tokenism if i'm just looking for that that person mm -hmm. well that's a, a wonderful thing and i've been working on this a lot during the pandemic. And what one of the curious things is, um, I don't know about you, but with my closest friends, I've been having this conversation for 30 years <laughs> and we are still discovering things. And I'm talking about when I'm talking only with African-Americans and also when I'm talking with my, my colleagues who are, are, are Latinx and also uh, Asian. And then uh, around other issues of intersectionality, which I didn't go into today, is that, that there's constantly availability of discovery. And I'll give you just one example. I work with a group of people who are academic group consultants and organizations. We have been since COVID meeting about once a month. And what we are noticing is the differentiated ways that we understand blackness. And we are having a huge debate right now is that if we are talking about blackness in terms of whiteness or whether we can talk about blackness in terms of itself. Uh, one of the things that I think is important in terms of those of you who identify as in terms of whiteness or any space or place that is another ethnicity and blend is that what are the conversations within your group? What happens is that uh, when I have a conversation with Latinx 
uh, families and individuals. Uh, there is uh, an openness to talk about colorism and how it shows up in families. There is an openness to talk about economic opportunity. There's an openness to talk about different views of integration. And so sometimes the conversations within our own groups is a way to get ready for those conversations. Now, when we do open up and we begin to practice this with everybody else, it is very important, as Stephen says, is not to go find that black friend and say, oh, I've wanted to talk to you about this for six months <laughs> because you're gonna drive me crazy and you're gonna burden me and I'm gonna call it emotional labor, okay? That I'm not getting paid for. Uh, but there has to be a willingness to do the work, not to set me up for inquiry. I, 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 you know, I'm not your uh, Oprah uh, uh, show. <laughs> so let, let, let's begin to make sure that this is a discourse, that there's an exchange, that there's a reciprocity, so that you are as available for the exploration around your experience, the advantages that you have as a function of your race, the places of blame, blame, blame shame, doubt, uh, experiences that you may have had that have been pernicious, negative, violent, vile, that impact your view of me. When I'm able to have that level of conversation, then we're there. Then we're there. Thank you, Stephen, for asking that. Thank you. And I do have some more questions here. I mean, I, and I will say, as a follow on to my question about being rep you know, a representative friend, is I, I identify as white, cisgender, male, queer. And I have certainly been in a place where, oh, okay, can I talk to you about my, my nephew? Can I talk to you about, you know, because they want to know about someone they think is gay, someone that, and we, so I understand the role of being, in this, being put on as a tour guide. Or yes. A, yes. A, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that in turn. So I'm sensitive okay. there. And some but, of us are bridge people. And then those of us who are bridge people have to kind of accept that that's what we've been put on the planet to do. Uh, I hated it until I recognized that that's my job. That's what I do. I, I've lived in enough environments that are of enough difference that uh, I can translate, and I do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let me ask some questions that have been raised by a couple folks here about talking about creating non non uh, personal color allies that can help carry the message because. Uh, she says, Tara says that she's often feels like the token uh, person of color in a room or a discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> so Tara, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, part of it is um, uh, allowing for imperfection. I wish that I could say that my non-Black colleagues uh, were perfect allies. And there are some people who take the position that there is no such thing as a white ally uh, and that you cannot call yourself an ally, that you have to be deemed an ally. I'm not getting into all of that. What is important is for me, and this is how I do it, is that there are certain folks that I have who are allies who have lived experience, meaning that they, they have lived in neighborhoods, who have had friendships, who have worked in professional settings uh, that have allowed them or afforded them the capacity to have these conversations over decades. And in those situations, those kind of allies, if you will, I rely on in situations and circumstances to be able to speak into, I'm gonna use this blithely, white spaces uh, because my voice will not be heard, but theirs will be heard. There are other places where there are white allies because of position in terms of authority are able to say things and they will say it in clumsy ways and that's okay. But because of positional authority, they're able to at least get other people to be on board, to recognize. So what I look at is networks of allies who have different facets of the conversation that can be made available. When I try to do it myself, then what happens is I get burnt out, resentful, and then you know I just get enraged. Uh, but I don't really rage in that moment, but it really becomes enraging to me. Our challenge is to figure out then who can do pieces of this to give us a moment to step back, 
and to be able to re-enter and provide our own experience and not feel like we have to do the whole education ourselves. That's been how I've gone about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, and let me say, as someone I identify, I think, as a clumsy ally, and I think the clumsiness sometimes gives comfort to others in the room who would like to be allies and see that the, the lack of perfection that you described. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, and and, and if you can, and if you can be the clumsy ally, and and have enough resilience to not fall into silence or feel like that that means that you are somehow an awful human being and that you've exposed your racism and all of that stuff. That's key. So, oh, I was clumsy. Gosh, that sounded racist. Oh, I recognize I did that. And just to sort of own it. And then you keep going as opposed to, oh, okay, then I need to shut up now. I, 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 it's evident. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, you don't, but let's keep going. Otherwise we don't learn how to do this together. Exactly. Well, let me ask you a question from Rosalina Spencer. Mm -hmm. uh, she says that now that we recognize how our mind uses these types of shortcuts without us being entirely aware, do you have any practical tips apart from just awareness on how to dismantle these biases? Okay, yeah. Okay, so, you know, if this were a whole implicit bias training, what we would do is I start with that slide and people go, whoa. <laughs> then the next part is then I, a simple exercise that I have people do is to sit one minute with another person and they don't even have to be a person that is different. And then that person tells you his, her, their story. And then you do the same thing. And then you repeat back the story that you hear from each other. What is going to show up is that you believe that you are presenting yourself in this one way that it's really clear. And the other person believes that they are doing the same thing. And someplace in there is the gap. That gap begins to explode, ex yeah, explode sometimes, but it, it exposes the kinds of ways that we show up implicitly with each other. Uh, if you don't wanna do this like at the big level, you can do this with any member of your family right now or a close friend. And you will notice that there are ways that you show up to each other that you, you do that are automatic where you fill in the gaps. And then say so one of the ways that I fill in the gaps with you is because you wear glasses and you know, I assume that you're nearsighted. I don't know if you're nearsighted or farsighted. For example, something as small as that, okay? Uh, your dear friends, you don't know how old they are, really, okay? You don't know where they're from, really. And so all of those kinds of things then allows us to begin to develop a currency for the conversations. And the currency for the conversations then gives us the scaffolding for the practice. And then invariably, when the implicit bias shows up, I'll give a small example. I was presenting at an organization. Uh, it was my paper that I was presenting, but there was one male who <laughs> did a summary of my paper, uh, explained what I was going to do. And uh, he did not even see that he was stepping in front of me uh, and feeling as if he had to be the one to do this. And then we talked about it and, after, and he had no idea. And then since then, just in terms of our own relationship, he doesn't do that anymore. And so that's another part of it is that in our individual interpersonal relationships to be in the practice, and then we're able to see it in other places and spaces. It's like a ripple effect. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I think the practical, uh, a lot of folks who are been made very much aware I think the, this reawakening, if you will, that has happened since the murder of George Floyd has been an opportunity for reflection. People are looking for practical things they can Absolutely. do. So thank you for, for sharing for sharing that. Um, and uh, I, I, I'll read a comment from Dolores Diaz that sometimes I find it better for a white ally to carry my cultural message. Example, earlier there was a discussion where a white ally had to come out, point out the policymakers that they shouldn't assume that we are used to living crowded. Um, that was that was Laura Nunn's comment, actually, yeah. and, and I'm glad she said it because Laura may not have been, or others might not have been as powerful as Laura in saying that. Right, and it, and that's it, exactly the the model that I was talking about. There are certain spaces where, if a person around policy institutional issues has more hierarchical or status power in that organization if i say it then it can be diminished because oh you black people that's what you say all the time groan 
okay? But uh, if a person who is white affirms that, says that, then what happens is then there's a pause long enough and then say, oh, so is that what you were saying a minute ago, Zachary? Yes, that's the kind of thing. And then it's heard differently. And then that bridge then allows for a consideration of something that will not be heard uh, if it is just the person of color who's raising these issues many times. Thank you for raising that. That is absolutely something that needs to be clarified. Well, and, and can I uh, offer, I, our organization uh, is one that is, I, I will call it, uh, largely white led just because when mm -hmm. we started we were small there was three of us three of us who were white we've grown most of it has been in, in growth in with persons of color mm -hmm. um and aside from uh, apart from simply standing aside or standing down how mm -hmm. do we empower uh the, the folks in that organization so that we become more you know in effectively uh, supporting diversity I can't ask people to simply step aside, and, I, and at some point I will. <laughs> no. but, but you know, that's a transition. Absolutely. See, a lot of what happens is that there's a difference between temporary measures that address historical inequities. You know, so that we make sure that we identify and cultivate uh, BIPOC populations to be a part of groups, and what you're already doing. That's fantastic. And it isn't about stepping down or stepping aside, it's about then stepping alongside uh, so that the transition over time is something that is available as the conversation. So you say, I was a founder of this, I'm all into this, I'm not going anywhere, I don't wanna go anywhere, it's all good. Okay, so what, when are you leaving? <laughs> so I'm not leaving anytime soon. Okay, good. Then uh, how do we then make sure that the voices that are emerging that are reflective of the communities that we serve then begin to have more agency? Ah, then that, that what we can talk about. So if we only think of it in terms of the, the positions that people hold, then that's a much too narrow conversation. If we think about it as the overall mission and how the mission is then more reflective of those populations, is what I'm working on with several organizations right now. So that you begin to think about a three to five year transition as opposed to now. And some people want it now. And the conversation is about how. Well, that's uh, and the comment on that is the power sharing is the part that some people in power will have difficulty with. Absolutely, they will. And 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 this is where the little gear was a part of, is that if the people in power don't want to have that, then the gear doesn't ever get started. I work with some organizations. We did our statement after George Floyd last year. Done. I'm working with other organizations that are in a year and a half internal study of their policies, procedures, practices. In addition to that, they're doing implicit bias training with each other. In addition to that, they're doing work within their respective teams and they're using the year to then launch from now what it is that they're going to do to make sure that going forward, they change. So if you don't have the people in power that are willing to do that, it's not gonna shift. I'm, I'm just letting you know, that is how this is perpetuated. But those who are in positions of authority would need to begin to move from performative to transformative in order for this to happen. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, see if folks have other questions because I know. Uh, uh, yeah, I have to go Dr. back. Green, to the, you, you, yeah, I have to go back to the Air Force <laughs> for five got... minutes. But you know, I, I can stay for five <laughs> more minutes. Right. Well, let me just make sure because if we, if we can give you five minutes back, I know how much I can appreciate a five-minute break between things. So I'm going to ask folks if there's any last words. Um, uh, in, if while I'm, while we're waiting for folks to assemble their thoughts, I, I do want to thank you on behalf of the Federation of our many members, the members of the, of the Alliance for Fair Housing here in San Diego. Um, thank you for, for, I think, what I certainly found enlightening and very much what we had hoped for after uh, yesterday's discussion, which was necessary. Uh, Daniel Enemark, if you don't know his work uh, doing a lot of the analysis of the, the very, the, the nuts and bolts of racism and the impact on families economically, especially, um, you know, so what you brought us, I think, was, was some genuine healing and paths forward. And I personally am grateful, and I think I speak for, for many folks here based on the comments and who I know is in the room.
I will only speak for the ones I know. I won't speak for the folks I don't know. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm um, seeing the comments and I really appreciate the comments that uh, you're offering. I really appreciate your own work through the presentation in terms of your own awareness. And I appreciate the efforts of uh, uh, the organizations here to, to make this available as a part of the learning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Green. Yeah, take care now. We look forward to working and, and knowing you better, I hope, in the future. Okay, sure. Well. Bye bye. So, um, thank you. I'm going to hand it off to Estela de los Rios uh, to carry us into the break. Um, I do, I will say a little bit about the afternoon before I hand it to Estela, which is that we have some remarkable. Um, uh, testimonials that are coming from from folks in the in the later part of the program and so firsthand experience uh, in particular uh, from the heal network folks with lived experience of homelessness and I think you'll find that enlightening so please do come back after the after uh, for the afternoon session uh, and with that I am going to sit and process a lot of what we just happened and hand it off to Estela thank you Stephen wow thank you Dr. Green that was so informative and so inspiring I'd like to take a moment as we celebrate Fair Housing Month, I'd like to invite everyone here to please uh, join CSA San Diego County Fair Housing on April 28th and 29th uh, so that we can, uh, we will present a title called COVID-19 Conundrum. We're gonna address structural inequities that establish barriers on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, and disability. And we're gonna spark the conversation on social justice, structural racism, economics, women, and health. And in the chat, you will find the registration. Please take the time and register. And before we go to break, we're going to uh, speak, we're gonna have some housekeeping from um, Ms. Laura Nunn. And um, enjoy the rest of the conversation as we come back. Remember to uh, link on to this afternoon session. Uh, you did receive two links. And um, the link for the morning was this morning and the link for this afternoon is a different link. So please make sure, ensure that you check the link. And um, yes, if Laura, if you can just remind folks on some housekeeping, please. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Sorry for, for the delay there. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Nunn, uh, Chief of Policy and Education with the San Diego Housing Federation. Um, thank you all for being with us this morning. Very, um, you know, I think very, very important information uh, for all of us. And I think uh, I'm glad that we'll have a little bit of a longer break to process all of what we just heard and learned. Um, as far as housekeeping items, uh, you'll see in the chat that Brooklyn uh, put the link for the um, for the afternoon session. Please do join us. That's really uh, that session where we will be able to hear from folks with lived experience and hear some personal stories. Um, it, it really helps to put into the into context all of the work that uh, that we all do every day, and that um, also that we. Um, that we are here for uh, for this conference. Um, and then Brooklyn will also uh, put in the chat in the afternoon, the link for um, the um, evaluation for the conference. Please take a moment to complete that evaluation. It helps us to better understand um, the value of the programming that we provide um, and, um, and learn more about what you you all want to see in the future. So please make sure to fill out the um, the program evaluation at the end. Um, I think that's everything. Um, and with that, I think we can we can close out this morning session. Take a bit of a longer break. I, I like Steve's um, recommendations um, to uh, to take a time to go outside, get some fresh air, get some sunlight. Um, what we are learning is, is pretty heavy material, pretty heavy information. So make sure that you're, you're taking that moment for self-care um, in between these sessions. 
Um, and with that, um, and Erin, I see your note that the survey didn't work uh, yesterday. We'll make sure to take a look at that um, for, the, for the survey link uh, before this, this afternoon session. With that, I think we are ready to close out and we look forward to seeing you all for the, for the next, next session. Thank you all for being with us.